Taylor. You're Brent. Oh my God, Taylor. Brent. How in the hell did you get here? I got here the same way you did. Spaceship, ape city, subway. By yourself? No, no, Nova found me. Nova? She, she with you? Where? I don't know. I don't know where she is. They separated us. They were trying to make me kill her. Hey there, Adrenal Heads. I am Jerry. And I'm Mark. And today we are once again going ape with the second in the series of the original Planet of the Apes movie franchise from 1970, Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Welcome back. Let's go bananas. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, with there, there's always a, a synopsis for the p- particular movie that we're covering. So Beneath the, the Planet of the Apes, which came out in 1970. So the synopsis is... Here, an astronaut sent to find the astronauts of the original film discovers not only a world of intelligent talking apes, but an underground cult of grotesque, quote-unquote, humans who are survivors of a nuclear blast from years ago. So, yeah, (laughs) that does make sense. Yep. And so let's move on to um, people you may know in the film. So, Mark, go ahead and start us off. Okay, uh, first off would be James Franciscus, who is also known as Brent in the particular film, has 77 film credits per IMDb, and oh my goodness, that is a lot. Uh, Did a lot of TV series prior and after Apes, Naked City, The Investigators, Mr. Novak, and Longstreet. Notable movies are The Valley of Bwanji, Concord Affair and Killer Fish. Yep, and uh, Valley of Guanji is one of our future movies. Yes, it is. Because it's Harryhausen. Yep. Next is Kim Hunter as Zira. She has 117 film credits. And again, she has a lot of TV. And she was in three of the five Apes film franchise. Original, today's movie, and the next movie in, in the series. She was also in A Streetcar Named Desire as Stella. Gee, I wonder, you know, wonder if we ever hear that name in that movie. Stella! <laughs> <laughs> and one of my favorites of the 90s, uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. Yeah, that was actually a really good movie, too. Mm-hmm. Next up would be Maurice Evans, and it would be Dr. Zayas, has 69 film credits per IMDb, reprises his role in this particular movie, uh, was in Rosemary's Baby as Hutch. Bewitched as Maurice, and Batman the TV series, as well as the movie The Jerk. Mm-hmm. And it's been forever since I've seen that one. Yeah, same here. Yeah, but I, yeah, but I'm not a big Steve Martin fan, so it's like, eh, <laughs> it's, just, it's not. Me. I'm sure Ben will actually have that on Wilhelm, based yeah, upon Steve Martin films. Yeah. So. Yes. Okay. Um, next, we have Linda Harrison as Nova. She has a uh, very few film credits. She only has 18. She was in Airport 75, Cocoon, and had a, a cameo in the 2001 Planet of the Apes movie and was in a TV show called Bracken's World. Hmm. And that was like, uh, I think, the uh, the world of modeling. Yeah. And Linda Harrison is very much, uh, I'm not sure if he's, she's still doing it. Is she? Did she pass away or is um, she still I believe uh, I believe Linda Harrison is the last surviving member of the cast. Okay, yeah, because the last time I saw her was about four years ago, basically because of the pandemic. I'm not clued into who's still alive, who's still doing that. But apparently Linda Harrison is still going out there doing convention circuits. So if you're able to go see her at a convention, do so. Because mm-hmm. that is like, you know, as Jerry stated, the last surviving member of the Planet of the Apes series. So if you could get her autograph and a picture of her as Nova, that would be perfect. Or even get a picture with her. That would mm-hmm. be amazing. And yeah. send that to uh, us, too, because that would be fun <laughs> to see. I would love to see that. Next up, James Gregory, General Ursus. He had 184 film credits per IMDb. Started in Barney Miller as one of the detectives as Luger, Gunsmoke, Big Valley, Rawhide, Police Story, The Lawless Years, 1920s Police Officer, that you actually put in, which was really cool, 
uh, one episode of Star Trek and a couple of episodes of The Twilight Zone. So you you said he was in one episode of Star Trek. I'm curious which one. Um, he was in one. Oh, um, it was one where they uh, he ran a, a mental institution mm-hmm. where he was actually making the people insane. Ah, pretty cool. Yeah, it was one. Yeah, and they kind of like uh, had people captured, and one of the um, and one of the other doctors kind of uh, stowed away on board a uh, on board a crate that was on the ship that you see you know, see in the very beginning. Ah. And one of the doctors pops out, and that's another. And that guy who popped out of the crate was in a couple episodes of Star Trek. Ah, cool. Okay, uh, next in supporting, we have uh, Paul Richards as Mendez, who has a uh, another 134 film credits and tons of TVs TV uh, credits. No leads, however, at least not that I saw. More of a character actor and has the the guy who is in that thing persona, which is I've seen him in a ton of stuff, you know, military, yeah. westerns, courtroom stuff. Yeah. Well, next up would be Victor Buono. Fat man <laughs> has 114 film credits per IMDb. Uh, I think a uh, character named after the bomb dropped on Nagasaki, famous for Batman as King Tut. Oh, my goodness. The 1966 Batman King Tut. And I he, never got that. And he was wow. in like, I want to say 10, somewhere around, in like somewhere between 8 and 10, somewhere around there. Yeah, he, he had done several in the 66 Batman. Wow, cool. Uh, next up in support, we have uh, Natalie Trendy as the, as she's listed as albino, has about 40 credits. And she was in four of the five, four, oh, excuse me, let me try that again. Next, we have Natalie Trendy, who plays Albino, has 39 credits and was in four of the five Apes movies. And she mm-hmm. has one of the distinctions of being one of the actors that plays both ape and humans in different movies. And, ah. and next time, and the next movie we do, we'll point that out. Ah, cool. Lastly, would be Charlton Heston as Taylor, has 134 film credits per IMDb. Saw him in past movie coverages, obviously. We've, yes. we've already talked to him about uh, like Charlton Heston in so many ways. Notable films, Ten Commandments, uh, El Cid, Airport 75, Midway, Soylent Green, et cetera, et cetera. There, there yeah. are so many. Yep. Yeah, so, yeah, Soylent Green had uh, questionable dietary choices. <sighs> Sorry, yeah. Mark. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, it, well, come on. I, I expect the puns. Yes. <laughs> okay, and then let's move on to general thoughts. Mark? <laughs> general thoughts of the movie? Honestly, uh, I love this film because it was the second film within the Ape series. I just really enjoyed it for what it is. Mind you, I thought it was going to continue more on with Charlton Heston, but we never got that. Literally, we have somebody who's pretty much a replacement for Charlton Heston for most of the film. We do. And then they kind of meet and they have this battle off because of the, uh, as I like to call, the crazy white people with nuclear weapons. Yes. (laughs) And that's literally what it is because you don't see anybody of color in there. You don't see an Asian. You don't see anybody who is African-American or anything of that nature. You see white people stripped of their skin. Yes. And they have to do battle. But to me, that was the most distinguished within this particular movie that really got to me. Because as a kid watching it, because this movie came out in the the 70s, I was a young child at that point. But I saw it in reruns on TV And to me, seeing that, and it's like you see the veins and everything and how it's all stripped. But they still had skin. Yeah. They still had skin. That that was the only thing. They Maybe slight burns. Yeah. But it still scared me as a child watching this on reruns, on TV, on UPN9, Channel 11 in New York City, and things of that nature. But it was kind of a strange moment within the ape series because it was their way of trying to end the ape series but later on we kind of figure out no it's not the end it's yeah. only the beginning and then that's where we're going to move on more with the uh the ape series as we go yeah and for me you know this is another movie in a great series and even though it's not the best of the series you know mm. and despite it does have some shortcomings the movie is very original and has yeah. some very surreal imagery, like mutants with peeled skin praying to a bomb, mm-hmm. and 
when it, this is one of these uh, these series that's very iconic in science fiction, and the other recent movies that have been done, you know, in the last what eight or nine years, kind of shows that. Because if yeah. it wasn't, you know, if it didn't stick around or it didn't have cultural significance, that they wouldn't have made three more movies out of it. Or yeah, well, they they made a ton of movies yes. and a TV show and, TV and show. cartoons. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> And they kind of uh, branched off and made kind of their own, which kind of influenced Star Wars at, at a certain point, too, if you think about it. And Star Trek, because Star Trek actually had a cartoon series, too, yes. within the 70s as well. Yeah, it was around, um, it was like 1972 to 73 that they had that, that series on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so let's move on to our favorite scenes in the movie. So, Mark, go ahead and start us off. Well, uh, first favorite scene for me would be seeing Brent and his captain, and his captain is blind, and the captain is telling him basically he has to move on mm -hmm. and keep going, but eventually, obviously, the captain dies, and we know that Brent is the new quote-unquote hero within this particular movie, so at least we get a new hero at this point, but we do see the old hero from the last film, which is great too because we all want charlton heston at certain points yes yeah for me the the first scene i have is the opening where we see the kind of the rehash of the fi the final part of the last movie and we see taylor and nova entering the forbidden zone falling prey to these hallucinations by as mm -hmm. yet unseen mutants and yep. taylor disappearing when he's trying to like when he think he tries to butt the rifle up against the cliff mm -hmm. and just falls right through it yeah, it's it's kind of segueing into this particular movie, which makes sense. I think they were probably reshot at that point to get that point. So that way we can move into the next story, which is this particular movie, which yeah. I do enjoy because we don't get that with certain movies now with, when it comes to trilogies or quadrilogies or whatever. They kind of just jump forward into some sort of new story. With this, they actually move fluidly, yeah, and it works there, well. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's a nice book ending on each end there. So yeah, yeah. Because I've much seen, like yeah. a uh, it, well, well, to move on to what your uh, our thoughts on that kind of like a serial in movies. Correct. Yes. <laughs> you know, kind of like Buck Rogers, uh, and you know, and his ideas of the universe and blah blah blah. The, and they did that with Batman too at certain points too. For because they wanted kids to come back every week mm -hmm. with this, this is their idea within movies to do that in the seventies. Yeah, that's just my thought. And TV has been kind of going back and forth between like an entire series mm -hmm. of like an entire season being one serialized story as opposed to being episodic. Exactly. But with like some series like Star Trek, like the recent one just that was just released, Strange New Worlds has been episodic. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's been no connection. And the others so far have all been serialized, and and we see that with some other some other series because they they have that's the way it was intended mm -hmm. for that one story to be told. Well, the question about the Star Trek now that you bring that up because it is new, is that canon in Star Trek? Yes, it is okay, canon. Cool. <laughs> uh, so, what's your next point, Mark? Uh, next point would be uh, Brent's interaction with Zero and Cornelius. But the one disturbing part was with, you know, was that Cornelius was like the interrogation with hitting Zira. It's kind mm -hmm. of dated at this point, but it kind of shows for its time that it's okay to hit a woman. And nowadays, yeah. no, that is a no goer. <laughs> yeah. So and at least in the context of the story, it says, yeah, it, you know, he hit me for being for being whatever during the meeting, during that rally that Ursus was holding. And she says, you know, and Zayas is like, well, OK. Yeah, to me, that <laughs> was a, no. a hard <laughs> yeah. pill to swallow at that point. You know, honestly, it's like you don't hit a woman that I've been brought up that way. Don't hit a woman or, or treat others as you want to be treated as mm -hmm. it is. Honestly, there are a lot of women that could kick my ass, but, uh, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, uh, and honestly, you want to be treated as you wanted, you know, you treat others. So, you know, treat people respectively. Mm -hmm. 
and yeah. it shows it for its time because that was a transitional time if you think about it within the 70s yeah my next point is during this rally or whatever that ursus was holding mm -hmm. Urging his, you know, because there's you have the apes, you have the orangutans, and you have the chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. And whenever Ursus is making one of his points, the apes are just like cheering and cheering and cheering, and the other two groups are just sitting there, just like stone faced and just or afraid to afraid to show any kind of resistance. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> no here, yeah, no Mark's say. Making, no yeah. here, no say. Yeah. It's like yeah, Mark's making the motion. Yeah. <laughs> of see no evil, hear no yeah, evil. Exactly. And speaking <laughs> yeah, and so during this, Zara is doing her former protest by remaining seated when everybody else is standing. And you can see like that the orangutans and the chimpanzees kind of reluctantly stand and clap. Yeah, and I have to agree that that, that was my next point. The mm -hmm. uh, the apes starting their little protest and how the apes come in and dealt with it. it it's very reflective of what is going on still to this day with everyone and their points of view in life and how to, um, you know, I, I guess say rule the world or, you know, take hold of this world. And I don't think that we'll, you know, we'll be ever rid of that uh, at any certain mm -hmm. point. There's always going to be some opposing force, but you can have people that are always, as I was motioning, speak no evil, hear no evil. And, People are not going to speak their voices and people are going to just shut up and hide and do whatever they do. Or stay deaf to the rhetoric. Exactly. So uh, whether it be gorilla, human, or alien at this point, it makes me think what would happen if there were aliens on this planet and, uh, you know, on this planet. It's still and uh, and they just decide to stay here and we just treat them like animals or speci specimens like you know, we do ourselves, you know, as humans treat everybody as equally, but you know, it's yep. there. That's that particular governing rule. Do they really want to be here? I don't think so. I think that's why they're staying outside of our solar system at this point. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, and I would think that, you know, they wouldn't really want to deal with us. And, and other than that, you know, our, our signals are only what a hundred light years out of by this yeah. point, more or less. And are there any inhabited systems that could even hear it? And what would they be hearing? You know, think about the all the transmissions that were out a hundred years ago. So you know, they won't even, you know, they won't even get it yet. So. Or they've already gotten it. They came here and they go, "Oh yeah. crap!" You know, or say, "It's nope. a garbage dump." Why are we here? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, they say they're not going to get off their planet anytime soon to any any degree, you know, other than like the Voyager probes. Yeah. That's not it. <laughs> oh, no, V'ger. You mean V'ger. Oh, yeah. Excuse me. V'ger. Yes. <laughs> for all you Star Trek fans out there. For those Star Trek. Yeah, yeah. For the Star Trek people out there. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So uh, are you the next point or am I you the next point? You are. Okay. Um, see, what we see on the way to invade the column of soldiers led by Zaius and Ursus, they see a protest chimpanzee, uh, a chimpanzee protest and they're seated, like you're doing a sit-in, blocking the way of the soldiers, and the soldiers move them out of the way. And that's representative of the Vietnam War protests going on at that during time, that time. Yeah, yeah, I kind of caught that too. And that mm -hmm. uh, that's a good catch. A lot of these films are based upon what is happening at that time. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see that more and more with films that we see coming out within future. We're going to see a lot of stuff. And... Uh, I'm sure we're going to be covering that stuff over time, too, on this particular podcast. But we'll equate that at that time. But, you know, th this is very particular to that time. And I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out. Yeah. And, and I always think, you know, in you got to think contemporaneously just what are uh, or it's, I don't know if that's the right word. But you just gotta, uh, again, you got to think about what's happening in that time and know that. You, you, and even if they show representations of the future, that they show that whatever's going on present day is happening in that future. Yeah. Well, history does seem to repeat itself, mm -hmm. as we know, between yes. Romans, the Greeks, Egyptians, everything. All these mm -hmm. great cities in the world have crumbled over time. And then we seem to be destined to do and repeat ourselves. 
I'm curious as to see was, you know, what's going to happen to our uh, children or ground ch- grandchildren or whatever. You know, it, it's going to be interesting at that point. Exactly. So what's your next uh, point? Next point would be, uh, well, seeing Brent and Nova go through the tunnels. You know, they go oh, through yeah. those particular tunnels. They're all perfect porcelain at that time, which is a great representation. But I don't think it's realism in any respect. But visually in a movie, it was great. I thought it was like, wow, that's amazing. If everything yeah. looked like that after a catastrophe, that would be great. Uh, yeah, and after, what, about 3,000 years or so? Exactly. Something out of a porcelain yeah. getaway within a rich person's home, in my opinion. Uh, but <laughs> then they find you know themselves within New York City, and they see every street that is known, and it's still preserved. It's something mm-hmm. out of Demolition Man. Yeah, out of because you know, when they're in the yeah. the subway tunnel, yeah, they were. yeah, like what, yeah, I'm waiting for Stone going. Yo, no, here it is. It's uh, <laughs> West Side Highway, <laughs> and then so Washington coming out. Go, yo, man, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good that's Lord, a great character, okay. but yeah, six. <laughs> All right, um, next one for me is. Um, the church service with the revelation of the mutants like taking their mask off and they have this whole entire ser- service praying to the bomb yeah in making because making all these religious glory be the bomb and all that whatever yeah. they're doing yeah. and i think they call it the holy fallout they, they do or i yeah. think it was <laughs> which kind of actually makes me think too as actually watching this after a while and i'm uh, i'm a huge heavy metal fan and I love Ozzy Osbourne just like anybody else that that's out there. Not just Black Sabbath, but Ozzy Osbourne. So Ozzy had a, an album called The Ultimate Sin. And he had a song called Thank God for the Bomb. And it kind of wow. falls within the respect. And every time I hear that particular song, Nukum Nukum, like during the, the chorus, <laughs> it just reminds me of this particular movie. Because literally that's what they're looking to do is like to renew the world with nuclear bombs and destroy. And they're praising this bomb as their God. And it's just so sad. Yeah. And one thing, you know, one thing I'd always, you know, always remembered is that like forest fires are supposed to be very cleansing for a forest. And that after, after a fire rips through is that a whole new you know, like a whole new uh, underbrush and whole new canopy grows in. Mm. And that was like, maybe their reasoning for that. Hmm. You know, thinking, you know, thinking in that context, it's like, well, you know, why would they want to, you know, what is the reason for worshiping this bomb other than, you know, uh, it's have it be, having it be, it's their <laughs> new life. It, yeah. It's kind of somebody who's seeking out religion to help them within their life because mm-hmm. they, went through so much and it's like all right the gorillas are like no we don't need that we have our own life (laughs) and it's opposing forces of those particular religions if you think about it yeah and and when they remove their masks it is just like terrifying you know not yeah not it's horrifying you know at that time but see now you look at it's like okay that's just a skin mask yeah yeah it's like uh, yeah that's nothing You could you could show yeah. that to an eight year old. They're like, ah, I see worse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And uh, but I'm thinking, you know, again, I don't think this movie would ever be remade. You know, to this the, the way it's done now. Yeah. But I'm thinking that they would have a lot more like a grotesque, you know, grotesque uh, be more facade like, on there, like skin eroding and things melting uh-huh. off and things of that nature. And it would have. Very much what you get for like four or five thousand dollars for like a skin mask that fits perfectly mm-hmm. to your face around your eyes, and literally that's what they were presenting within this particular movie. And you've seen them, yeah. everybody. I'm sure you saw the Facebook videos that people do. Like, oh, I showed up as a homeless person in front of my boyfriend, and they had like an old man mask on. It was mm-hmm. perfect to their face. Mm-hmm. No. This is perfect to their face to hide what they were covering and concealing. Unfortunately, if it was real and it was a modern day movie, you'd see blood, 
pus, everything leaking out. Yeah. And once they took those masks off, and you would see the realism of it. Yeah. To show that true horror of the radiation that they were that they had suffered. Yeah, and, and they still are suffering through off. because they're yeah. literally living dead at that point. Yes. <laughs> okay. So go ahead, Mark. Uh, the next one would be the checkerboard scene where Brent and Nova are, you know, brought before the uh, constituent or the jury, as it were. Uh, and it's pretty much a game of life with these people. And, and in yeah. my opinion, you know, it's like they're, they're trying to judge them. But that's when they pulled off those masks and they showed them who they were. And that's mm -hmm. when it kind of freaked out, and that's when they were thrown into cells, and then they were able to see Taylor. And then, obviously, Brent and Taylor, that whole Brent and Taylor uh, fight-off, as it were. That that was an interesting scene. I'm pretty sure you have that next. Um, no, actually, no. I have the... Um... I have the invasion of the Forbidden Zone by the, the Column of Soldiers, where the the uh, mutants put forth the illusion about the lawgiver burning in fire with, you know, with the bodies of apes impaled on stakes beneath hmm. them. The, you know, and the lawgiver's face bleeding. But again, they don't have the, the apes in this time in this movie don't have the mental capacity to hold that illusion. Nah. Because they're not smart enough. <laughs> yeah, and Zayas and Zayas recognizes it as, as an illusion. Yeah. That that's how they always perceive it because they don't have the mm -hmm. highest of intelligence. They just go amongst what they do with their own community. Yeah, which is fine too. It, it, you know, it's like ignorance is bliss. I guess. Yeah, it's got to be. <laughs> well, anyway, All right. So go ahead, Mark. Uh, that was it for me. Oh, that was it. Okay. Yeah, that was it for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> but we can talk about that whole situation with Brent versus uh, Taylor. What did you think about that battle scene? Yeah, well, that one was because the um, the mutant made them fight each mm -hmm. other. And I do have a quote for, you know, for that, you know, for that. All scene. right, cool. Let's move on to interesting facts and unknown facts about the movie. So, Mark, can you start us off. Interesting facts. The first one that you have here. Well, Roddy McDowell was not able to reprise his role as Cornelius. David Watson filmed in for him at that point, which is something yeah. that I actually have in some of my other notes, too, which is very different, mm -hmm. too. And I think that's the only time that uh, Roddy McDowell was out of the Ape Correct. series. Yeah, because the, the point for um, Cornelius was very, you know, it was more of a supporting role in this mm -hmm. one. Because it was just like what two scenes, literally, that he was in. Yeah, yeah, literally only two scenes. And and it sounded like uh, Roddy McDowell did some voiceover for Watson in that because I don't know what, what Watson's voice actually sounds like. Hmm. No, because it, it sounded it sounded like it Roddy sounded McDowell. like him, but it wasn't him. Honestly, I I listened okay. to it a few times. I have this on Blu-ray, so that's how much of a geek okay. or nerd I am. I have the whole series, all the Ape series, on Blu-ray. So uh, I mm -hmm. actually watched the movie and uh, the commentary states that, you know, Roddy had nothing to do with it. OK, so he was completely out. Yeah, because he was a, he had already committed to a film. I think it was in Scotland at Correct. the time. Yeah. OK, uh, next one here is due to the smaller budget of the film, which was half of what the first film was or even less than half. Vast majority of the extras cast as the apes wore pullover masks instead of the famous ape makeup, which. It showed, <laughs> yeah. Especially during the uh, during the um, assembly, yeah, the assembly. And you you saw how they like, were just masks over their heads, except for the the more important characters that had the prosthetics. Yeah. So they were trying mm -hmm. to narrow down the uh, the effects makeup at that point for uh, cost effective. Yeah, because yeah, because I can see that being like one of your most expensive uh, expensive items right there. Oh, it is. Well, next up would be Orson Welles was offered the role of General Ursus, which he turned down because he didn't want to be in a mask and makeup, which I understand. Which I don't blame him. Yeah, I don't yeah. blame him. <laughs> yeah, well, an actor's voice and face is really what makes them who they are. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. again, you know, Orson Welles actually did voice in the Transformers movie. Yes, Unicron. <laughs> 
I love that yeah, movie. I think <laughs> we all do. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, at least the uh, the Transformers fans in us do. Yeah. Okay. Um, next one here is, despite the original Planet of the Apes being a significant success, the budget was slashed for this sequel. It had gone from $5 million to $2.5 million in one fell swoop. And this was mainly due to 20th Century Fox teetering on the brink of bankruptcy following some majorly expensive failures such as Hello Dolly, Star, and Tora Tora Tora. Really? Wow. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking like cost versus uh, return. Yeah. Made them yeah. failures. Yeah. The, well, think about it. The apes really... The first movie, they got money. This one... Oh, yeah. They got way... Yeah, yeah, not so much. One, not so much. Yeah, yeah. It still made a profit, but not nearly as much as the first one did because you know. But I'm thinking you always want to think percentage, you know, because if you think about like a, a five or six hundred percent return, then you're yeah. Good. Well, you want to make at least twenty five percent more of what you made to make some sort of mm -hmm. a profit. I, I don't think they even achieved that, with this. but they continued on with the series, which is pretty funny. Yep. All right. Well, next up, the uh, the sets of the mutants council chamber are redressed sets from Hello Dolly from 1969, Hotel Lobby, and Grand Central Station. So that's pretty interesting. Yeah, and I think the Hollywood rule is reuse, reuse, reuse. Because yeah. it, you know, well, that that's what it was. Because they just reuse movie sets. Uh, honestly. I have to laugh at this because I started getting into a binge watch of a show that I loved when I was about 10 years old. Came out in 1980 or uh, about 1981, 82, maybe called the Voyagers. And it was very much what the librarians were that came out recently in most recent years. Huh. And, but in this case, it was a uh, time traveler that went through and corrected you know time with the kid because he got stuck with the kid and all he had was his time mm -hmm. device which was called the omni and he lost his manual which you know kind of like you know the greatest american hero he lost his manual and he instructs and, I <laughs> and i just yes. love that series and i i got it on amazon recently i had to I have it on DVD somewhere. I just can't find it. So uh, one night I was like, I have to binge watch this show because I remember it and I loved it. You know, about Thomas Edison, Bell, the Wright brothers, everything that fell in between. Uh, they had a whole mm -hmm. Cleopatra scandal too with uh, Babe Ruth. Honestly, to me, there are so many things that they used within that particular show that you could see on the Universal lots. And you, yeah. Jerry, coming from California, I don't know if you've gone to L.A. Where, and Universal where they have done those where you do the tours. Yes. They're amazing. I, I, yeah. I've been there three times. Yeah, it's been a while since I've done it. I think the last time I was there was about maybe 15 mm -hmm. years ago. But I, I do want to go back again to see what how much of the but stuff they, they, has changed. They do keep those particular uh -huh. sets available, too, because they're historic. Yeah. They've been around since like the yeah. 20s and 30s, and it's amazing mm -hmm. to go see them. But it, it just kind of reminded me of that, you know, for the fact that they utilized and they used sets, older sets, for other films. It makes me think, what did they use for Star Trek? Did they use older sets from Star Trek for Next Gen? Um, they used, uh, well, yeah, I, when I was just going to mention like two instances I, I remember here, like the, um, the, I call them Kirk Rock, the Kirk Rocks or the Gorn Rocks. The Gorn, is that yeah. <laughs> they use yeah, the 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 uh, rock formation yep. that's slanted. It's called Vasquez yep. Rocks. Is that I've seen that in three? I think I want to say three episodes, three or four episodes, because it's you know it's about twenty miles away from wow. Hollywood, which is easy to locate to. Plus, I've seen it in Westworld. I've seen it in they did it um in one of the Bill and Ted movies. I think it was yeah. the second movie. Because <laughs> they were doing kind of like a mimicking of you know <laughs> where they're shooting it, and I, and I can't remember. I've seen it in a couple other spots because that rock formation is very you know very it's, unique. It's uh, synonymous with like I guess film industry at this point, you know. And I mm -hmm. I know people that actually visited that particular area too that are YouTubers, and uh, that would be Michael and Jessica from Grim Life Collective, and they they have gone out and saw those events and filmed it so uh you listeners go out there 
check that out. Check out the Grim Life Collective because they actually do have filming scene locations and they will talk about that stuff. And Mike likes to go out there and do the hikes. Trust me, the last time he was like, oh, my God, that was a hike. And it was for him. Yeah, it's a little bit of a hike to get there. And, you know, you got to be in really in your best physical effort at this point. Now that we're coming out of a pandemic and everybody's able to move and work, you could do it. Go out and do it and have a good time. Exactly. I plan on going to Mm -hmm. Crystal Lake, hopefully soon, at Camp Noby Bosco with our friend Jamie Dimmick. And we could probably plan that out for the summer so we could have a good time traveling around the original Friday the 13th campgrounds. But those are the things that you would love to do, and I highly suggest it. And um, the other one I saw was another episode of Star Trek where they came upon a duplicate Earth and that was kind of devastated by a plague. And if you look at one section, there's like what looks like a a courthouse with a gable front and it has like the marble steps with the two columns Mm. on the side. And it's the same one that's used in Mayberry on the Andy really? Griffith show. <laughs> yes. They just like kind of redress the redress awesome. that lot. Yeah, well, it, it's all reused mm-hmm. stuff because it, yeah, it's, it's all, all reused anyway. You know. Okay. And then to that point, next point here is the subway tunnel system that we see in this movie was reused for Conquest of the Planet of the Apes, among yeah. other movies. And the next one we're doing is actually... Um, was it? Uh, I think it is Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. The next, oh no, Escape. Escape, Escape from the yeah, Escape from the Planet of the Apes is the next one because Conquest yeah. is the fourth one. I'm, I'm getting my uh, getting my movies out of order here. So yeah, I remember seeing that movie a while back, and it's like, oh yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> well, next up, it, it took a lot of persuasion for both Charlton Heston and Kim Hunter to reprise their roles for this particular film. Heston didn't believe in making sequels as a rule. And Hunter had such an ordeal with the rigors of dealing with the makeup appliances during the first film. Which I can understand. No, I can understand too. But in years later, when she had gone to conventions, people who I know that met her, she still, to that day, loved being in the makeup. You know, she loves the idea, you know, that she is known as, you know, Zara. Yeah, and that and that's again one of the iconic characters in in film history, and especially of science fiction. Yes, because I was going to say, you know, of you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of characters, but I'd say she's at least top uh, top two hundred ever. Yes, yeah, and she's known because the movie is so. Well, the series is iconic; mm-hmm. everybody knows it, and they know her voice. If you you hear Zara in a show, and you're like, "Oh, that's not her," mm-hmm. you know, it's not Kim Hunter. Yeah, you know? exactly. Okay, uh, next point here is Heston, you know, who was finally convinced, committed to the role and gave the director only two weeks to finish the filming and insisted that his character Taylor be killed, which it, you know, which he did. And Heston donated all of his earnings to charity, which he was always good about stuff like that. So, Oh, he's always been good at that. He was till his death was a gun rights advocate. Mm-hmm. too. My father loved Charlton Heston. (laughs) Honestly, you know, it's like I I can understand somebody, you know, the, you know, that is one of our things that is available to us is uh, as Americans. And Mm -hmm. I'm Republican, but I do have liberal thoughts on certain things. And one of those is the right to bear arms. But within Mm -hmm. a certain respect of like if you broke the law, if you went to, you know, if you were in prison in a certain way, you have convictions, there are issues. There's got to be some sort of hold. And both my father and myself and my brother Mm -hmm. both feel that way. We all feel that way in in our family. And my father was a police officer. My brother was a police officer. And Heston gave away to charities. And it showed very much respect to other people. Yeah. And I I respect the man. A lot of people hated it because (laughs) they they hated it because he was the – NRA spokesman spokesperson yeah. for years, but uh, they kind of looked at it in a bad light. Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, he did the right thing, but you know, at least you know it, it shows a matter of respect to other people and fellow man. He gave yeah. things away to charity. Yeah, so you can say he stuck to his guns in that regard. <laughs> 
Sorry, Mark. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm not Daphne, so I'll I'll accept it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, it was right there. I had to take it. Yeah, you took the shot. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and as much as I disagree with you know, like with his stance on on weapons, you know, I'm not really a gun person, but I do respect because I do respect the power that those things have. You know. Yeah. And I've always had the number one, you know, the number one rule that my father drilled into my head about whenever you hold a weapon, always treat it like it's loaded. And especially when it is. Exactly. That is true. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, and the final point here is Burt Reynolds was considered for the role of Brent, but it was offered to Franciscus. I would love to see that. <laughs> and when I, and you know, when I, when I look in the movies and I read stuff like that, I was like, I would have loved to have seen that. Yeah. Just as like a as a one off to say, you know, you just kind of imagine what, you know, what it would have been like, because you see him in like the uh, the movies with Sally Field or like, I can't remember that. What the heck is that? Uh, Smokey and the Bandit. Smokey and the, God, why did my bra- why did my brain meat do that? Uh, it does. It. <laughs> but yeah, but you see, like, she only did one with them, actually two. But, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, but you see him in Smokey and the Bandit and it's like, I wonder what he would have been like in that movie. But, you know. <laughs> okay, so uh, with that, we're going to move on to quotes. Mark. All right, quotes. What do I have for quotes? This has been interesting. Where are my quotes? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, give me a sec. All right. I, I don't have anything here quotable, but I do have quotes, and it's the funniest thing. All right, I have. All right, cool. I got one. Mm-hmm. And this is zero to Dr. Zayas. What will he find out there? And Dr. Zayas says, and this is pretty much the uh, caveat from the first film to the new one, his destiny. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, this movie shows what we knew from the first Planet of the Is film. So, which we already had covered. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, um, I've got a few here. Uh, so my, mine is when they're oh, in the rally, when General Ursus is saying, says, I'll tell you one thing that every good soldier knows. The only thing that counts in the end is power, naked, merciless force to kind of like rile up, rile up his, uh, his soldiers. Yeah, the army. Mm-hmm. Yep. Next up for me would be uh, Dr. Say is saying, as Minister of Science, it is my duty to find out that some other form of life exists. And Zero retorts, where are you going? And Dr. Zayas says, into the forbid zones with Ursus. And Zero says, another manhunt, Doctor? And Dr. Zayas says, someone or something has outwitted the integrity of the gorillas. Which is very interesting. Yeah, like, how much integrity do they have to begin with? And how really do you have to outwit a gorilla? Not very. <laughs> well, and, and, and uh, you, you heard Zero during the film kind of making cracks like that, but not yeah. would be too hard to outwit a gorilla. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And to that point, you know, like during, uh, I think it was just before that, uh, when Cornelius is talking to Brent and mm-hmm. you, when he's going to send him out to remember, only apes can speak, not her and not you. If they catch you speaking, they will dissect you and they will kill you. In that order. <laughs> and and one of these things is like, I always, when some quote kind of makes me just like burst out laughing, it's like, I got to I got to keep it because it's just, <laughs> because it's just memorable for me. Yeah. I don't have any other uh, quotes at this point. So. All right. Whatever got, you got. Uh, I got three more. It's like, okay. During the ape invasion, uh, Zayas recognizes the illusion, you know, after seeing the image of the lawgivers, you know, bleeding when he's like uh, in the big uh, wall of fire and all the all the all the other apes are on stakes. He says, the spirit of the lawgiver lives. We are still God's chosen. This is a vision and it is a lie. And so he goes up into it and the illusion disappears, kind of like, you know, amazing, you know, amazing the apes to say that he recognized that. It's magic. It's magic, yes. <laughs> okay, um, and during the church service, or no, excuse me, after the church service, says mm-hmm. um, the, I believe his name is Mendez, talks, is talking to Brent, and there's him and another one of the mutants, says, I trust this simple ceremony convinced you of our peaceable intentions, and I would like to thank you for cooperation. 
Brent asks, when may we hope to be set free? And he replies, you may hope whenever you please, Mr. Brent. It's like, dang. <laughs> that means you're not going to get let go. No, you're not. <laughs> okay. To get Brent and Taylor to fight, and this is when the other mutants escorting Brent back to the cell, and this is where he meets up with Taylor and finds out, you know, he's there. Yeah. And they, they talk about, um, are you going to get us, you're going to kill your enemies, right? And the mutant tells Brett and Taylor, it's like, we don't kill our enemies. We get our enemies to kill each other through oh, illusion. Yeah. Yeah, it was like a mind game. Yes. <laughs> and and to that end, you know, all these illusions and everything that makes these makes people fight is again, it reminds me of the very, very first Star Trek episode with Jeffrey Hunter, the one with the original pilot was. The uh, al- yeah, the aliens in there also use illusion as a weapon. Mm-hmm. That is true. So they're pulling from Roddenberg. Roddenberg. Team Roddenberg. Little, Roddenberg. Sorry. Yeah. yeah Roddenberg. <laughs> yeah. And uh, during that fight, Nova screams out Taylor, uttering her first and only words. Yep. That was the only time we actually hear her speak, yeah. which is pretty cool. Yeah. And it was like, well, it was one of those things like, well, they are capable. She is capable. But if you never try to try to speak, you never, you know, or never taught that you could speak, you're never going to know. Well, she needed her sad card. Yeah. Oh, she did. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. That's right about speaking roles. <laughs> okay. Um, Taylor, uh, talking about the bomb, he says, Alpha and Omega, the Doomsday Bomb, another lovely souvenir from the 20th century. They weren't satisfied with a bomb that could only knock out a city. They finally built one with a cobalt casing, all in the sweet name of peace. Hmm. Interesting. Yes. And then um, when the apes enter the cathedral, they, uh, the one uh, mutant Mendez, he's, he's talking to the apes, says, this is the instrument of my God. And it surprises all the guerrilla soldiers that a human can talk. You know, they, again, they're. they're yeah, they never knew at that yeah, point, and, except uh, for Taylor yeah. or Brent. At yeah. that point, Taylor yeah, and, was the biggest one. Yeah. Brand that they hardly knew about. Mm-hmm. And, and then, now, now here's a third go, one. Here's oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and Ursus has has a, one of the sergeants shoot him and said, your guy didn't save you now, did he? I was like, this guy's, this guy's just cruel. <laughs> oh, and the fact that they all speak English, too. Yeah. And they all, yeah. <laughs> and, and can understand each other. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they didn't have, like, you know. Intergalactic communicators, so they could actually understand yeah, no, each other. Yeah, no universal <laughs> translators. Universal translator, yep. <laughs> um, next to last is uh, Taylor and Zayas are talking about this. He's, you know, after Taylor's shot, says, Zayas, it's doomsday, the end of the world, help me. And Zayas replies, You asked me to help you? Man is evil, capable of nothing but destruction, which is not altogether untrue. No, it's not untrue, but it's the same thing as apes as well, because they are pretty much where man came from. Yes. <laughs> and, you know, Taylor sets off the bomb. And in the in the final, you know, the final uh, voiceover that we hear, it says, in one of the countless billions of galaxies in this universe lies a medium sized star. And one of its satellites, a green and insignificant planet is now dead, which I had to go back because I recognize the voice from that voiceover. And do you okay. remember the part of the uh, 1960 time machine where ta- uh, where George spins the rings and they talk? Yeah. Same voice. Really? Yeah. There's like two, or, I think there's two different voices of the rings. The second one is his, that real deep voice. And he's the, and his name is Paul Fries, that voiceover guy. And he yeah. is also the uh, voiceover for the opening of uh, the War of the Worlds from 1953. Wow. That is awesome, and I and and it's one of those guys. It's like, it's, it's almost like a Benedict Cumberbatch or Morgan Freeman. It's like they are wonderful vo- for voiceover because they have mm-hmm. the voice for it. And oddly enough, that now that I say that, Morgan Freeman did the voiceover for the 2005 War of the Worlds movie. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. <laughs> as well as the Penguins, March. Of the and, Penguins. Oh yeah, March of the Penguins. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although com- completely different stories. Completely different stories, but a profound voice. Yes, for voice acting. Yeah, and there's now, prob- mind yeah. you, we, 
Yeah. yeah, we won't get a Will Smith. We might get a Dwayne The Rock Johnson eventually. Mm-hmm. Or we will get somebody else who is, you know, uh, uh, Benedict Cumberbatch has made a name for himself, not only as mm-hmm. Sherlock Holmes, but also as Doctor Strange and so much mm-hmm. others. Yeah, but one of my favorites of his was uh, voicing Smaug the Dragon. Oh, yeah. Oh, dude. <laughs> that was so stinking good. Yeah, and the, the Hobbit trilogy, yeah. as it were. Uh, Meanwhile, they could have done that in, like, at least two films, not three. Two two films would have been good. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's move on to our ratings of the movie. So, Mark, what would you rate this movie? Uh, for an Apes film, i definitely give it a 7.5 out of 10. Mm-hmm. And mine is I'm giving it a seven, you know, and despite, you know, despite it not being, you know, the best of the series, I still like it. It's good enough. Yeah, it's good enough here. to watch on the series. And again, you know, I've watched these films so many times over the years. I could just like set it to play and know what's happening throughout the. Yeah, well, I where I lived in New York City at the time when they would put these on repeat during like the late 70s and into the 80s, into the 90s on a Sunday afternoon. Uh-huh. This is one of those movies I could actually know where we're at within a particular movie if i just walked in going oh okay i'll watch it yeah i'll leave it on and i already know the dialogue what's going on because i grew up on this particular film just like you Mm -hmm. and i love these films as they are as a whole and as a full complete series now when i said seven and a half out, out of ten the reason why i said that is because this movie gave me the heebie jeebies at the very end Mm-hmm. Especially with the taking off the masks as a little kid, I saw that and freaked the hell out of me. As I get older, I kind of got into effects makeup and realized, okay, that's not real, but it kind of looks kind of nah, that wouldn't really be it. But I liked it for the fact as I got older, I got to appreciate it more and more. Yeah, so that that's why I gave it that half. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this one, um, I know that this is was something else I read about. This was the the film that nearly killed the franchise. Oh yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah, almost, <laughs> but you know, but I'm thinking, you know, the, despite their best efforts, like Heston, you know, killed off his character, so he wasn't coming back. No, and, but they they were able to find other people and other uh-huh. stories to work with it, and mm-hmm. they got back Roddy McDowell. They got Kim Hunter back, mm-hmm. and those two were the fulcrum of the show or the series, as it mm-hmm. were. And then eventually, Apes Madness happened. Mm-hmm. And everything was publicized, popularized within toys, puzzles, comic books, everything, which led into Lucas's idea of doing everything with Star Wars the same way. All the toys and everything. Yep. What was it? The toys that made us? Yeah. And if you watch that on Netflix, you'll hear it and you'll see it because they talk about Planet of the Apes before they get into Star Wars. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to uh, less popular movies, which are any movies that are not popular or great, but you just have to watch them once in a while because you just love them. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guess I'll start. Yes. For me, well, that would be The Omega Man. I've already mentioned this before. Mm-hmm. It's from 1971. It's pretty much, uh, yeah, it has Charlton Heston in it, and it, it's literally. What was that Will Smith movie? I am Legend. I am Legend. It, mm-hmm. It's literally I am the Legend. Yeah. And but the thing is, it's a different version of the particular film. Now, mind you, I enjoyed it, and the only reason why I bring it up again because Charlton Heston. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, and also that um, Vincent Price kind of did the original version of this called The Last Man on Earth. Yes. Yeah, which did. I I really like that film too, but. One thing about I Am Legend, if you're a dog lover, please be kind. <laughs> yes, because they will protect you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're a dog lover, be ready. <laughs> eh. All right. Uh, my movie, again, we're visiting a TV film again. And I remember seeing this when I was about maybe eight or so for the first time. It is called The Boy Who Cried Werewolf from 1973. I remember it, that yeah. movie. <laughs> it is <laughs> early yeah. enough. <laughs> yeah, it is available on YouTube. The actor, uh, the actor who plays the the lead here, who plays the werewolf, is Kerwin Matthews, who we will see in a future episode of Adrenaline. On he, he was in the Seventh Voyage of Sinbad. Oh wow! Mm-hmm. Awesome. 
Yeah. So on this movie, it's like a boy visits his father in a, at his cabin. The father is attacked by a werewolf and kills that werewolf, but then becomes one himself. And the boy tries to tell people about about his dad being a werewolf, but nobody believes him. Hmm. Interesting. And oddly cool. enough, it is, you know, but it's one of those like the I call it the Lon Chaney transformation, just for like the, the same camera just adds more. You know, it's not like an American werewolf in London. Mm. No, because I don't think anything can ever be that good as far as like a transformation. Yeah, yeah, that that was very extreme for its time, American oh. werewolf oh, in London. Yeah. yeah, but this one's just like the uh, sit still and add more, uh, you know, add more hair to your face kind of movie. But it is available on YouTube, so it's it's always worth the watch. Awesome. Yeah, and I found out too, and looking into that movie, I forget the name of the kid, but that was his only credit. Really? Yeah. Huh. So I don't know if he had like the the Jake Lloyd effect where he just got like so so hammered for doing that movie or not. It's like I would have to, I would have to look further into it. But uh, but speaking again, of Jake Lloyd, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, from Phantom Menace, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll be covering that shortly with our friend Rob, who is on the Pirate Core Entertainment Network as well with Fantasy Picks Movie Edition, and we're gonna do that and recast, figure out a script, and who it could change directorial mm. and story-wise within that to make the movie better, at least. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All righty. So um, go ahead and take on take on the feedback stuff. Oh, there is no feedback, okay. but obviously <laughs> anybody who wants to lead any feedback, all you have to go to is our Facebook page, which be facebook.com slash Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. You can just leave a comment, and when this particular episode loads, and then I share it, we'll talk about it on the next episode, obviously, or play your feedback if you leave a voicemail. And with that, you could actually send an email to us, and all you have to do is go to AdrenalineCinemaPodcast at gmail.com and send that particular email. You could also record your voice, like I stated, and send that as an attachment, and we'll play it. And we'll listen to it live as we're recording, if we're recording at that time. And with that, we could be heard on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, TuneIn, Deezer, whatever podcast player of choice. But the best way to show your love is to give us a rating or review in Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Google Podcasts. And I already mentioned it <laughs> within... Uh, what I'm doing next. So obviously we have gotten a new podcast for the Pyrocore Entertainment Network, and that would be Fantasy Picks Movie Edition with Rob Moda. So check that out. Just go to the PirateCoreEntertainment.com website and you'll be able to get all his feeds, his links, his Instagram, his Twitter, his Facebook, everything, and you can listen to it there on the website. If not, just go to your podcast player of choice, look up Fantasy Picks Movie Edition, and then subscribe, and you'll listen to everything that he has to offer. I think currently they have at least a good six or seven episodes. But I will be on the next one. That will be coming out, and that will be Star Wars The Phantom Menace. So check that out when you can, and please do subscribe if you like what Rob's doing with this podcast other than that uh jerry where can we hear you um i just recently did another episode of watched it in the 80s where damien and i covered dust boot awesome yeah that's a I, good movie oh i really like that movie but that movie is so stinking long <laughs> but it, is, it is so worth it though <laughs> it's like almost three hours right um i want to say yeah so it was, it's like three three and a half if i remember right so wow yeah it's a good movie and yeah. i highly recommend it you know it, it's one of those good Good to go war movies, but you know, it'll, yeah, if you're really into like really hurting yourself and watching a movie mentally, physically, mm -hmm. <laughs> you could do it. <laughs> but it is history. Yes. And it's like one of those, I, and I mentioned it on the podcast, is like, I always like to see the other side of the conflict as well. Exactly. Because, you know, they may be your adversary, but they're also still humans. Yeah. Everybody is the same way and they're just fighting for their country just the same. Whether or not it's the same thought and aspect, but they're doing it, whatever mm -hmm. they need for the country. And and, and, and they're war weary and you know, some are very patriotic and some are very war weary. Just like I think an American, you know, American subgroup might be after after going through what these guys have gone through. 
If they were then uh, same thing with the apes and the humans that are left alive still mm-hmm. in beneath the uh, planet of the apes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you could find me on Panels to Pixels podcast on the Next Level Online Radio Podcast Network. There and Steve Brown and I cover anything that is adapted from comics, going to movie, film, or anime. We wrapped up Moon Knight. We're going to move on to Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. As you're hearing this, you're probably on to the next thing. So we're probably going on to Miss Marvel at this point. Or we had something in between that we're just going to have fun with. Who knows? Maybe Morbius. We don't know. But we will have fun with it. Check us out there. And you can find Panels to Pixels on the Next Level Online Radio Podcast yeah. Network. And you know, that's about it. And um, I have to thank uh, Jerry for covering and taking control over this particular podcast when it comes to the apes because this is his passion he loves doing this and i love the apes as well but i don't love it as much as jerry does because he put all the hard work into this (laughs) at least this time around yes you did (laughs) yeah and we're looking forward to doing um what's our next one that we have on the docket is it angry red planet angry red planet yes so uh, if you guys are listening to this, check it out and then send us in feedback for that, too. If you are really into that kind of nostalgic kind of horror mm-hmm. movie or dark movie, as it were, we love these kind of things. That's why we do these particular podcasts. So with that, I just want to thank everybody for listening. I'm Mark. And I'm Jerry. And this was Adrenaline Cinema Podcast. And we'll catch you on the next reel. Later. Later.